that I come each and every week saying grace and peace from God the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I would like to first uh, confess my disobedience. We were told to sit down and listen to the new song, and I can only sit down half the time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's just something about that name, isn't there? Amen. Jesus. There's just something about that name. As we are continuing in our current series, Encounters with Christ, please turn in the Word of God to Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Today we are in part 8, called Corrected. And we know how we all love to be corrected. Today's message will have some difficult parts to it. And I just want you to know up front that I'm not some mean old fire and brimstone preacher. That's not my style. I'm certainly not some kind of a legalist. I believe that we Christians, as we sing all the time, are free in Christ. Amen? Amen. And I think that we should live joyful lives. In fact, I think as Christians that we should live such joyful lives that we make the uptight Christians nervous. With that saying, said, I stand upon the Word of God. And here at Living Hope Church, we preach what God has written. Amen? Amen. What the Holy Spirit has predicted and what Jesus has said in His encounters with us. So with that said, please stow your trays on the seat back in front of you. <laughs> Buckle your seat belt and return your chair to the full upright position as we launch this message today and all God's people said Amen. it is interesting that human beings are the only creatures that know that they are going to die and it seems that most of us are desperately trying to forget that, that event is coming we don't want to think about death and we, do, we tend to change the subject when it comes up but statistics show that one out of every one will die that's the simple statistic. Myself, I'm praying that the Lord Jesus Christ comes back first. Amen? Amen. Or that if my time comes, that it comes, as they'd like to say, unexpectedly. He unexpectedly wants to be with the Lord. Well, I knew I was going to be with the Lord, but let that part be unexpected and painless if at all possible. Friends, death runs in my family, and it runs in yours too. But there is life to be found in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so we are not trying to trick anyone here, whether you're in this sanctuary, uh, or you're watching on the internet, or you're watching a DVD or listening to a CD at some time later. I declare to you that until you are prepared to die, you are never really ready to live. You're never ready to live if that, if that has not taken place. Our parable today is about two men that have died. One man is rich, and one man is poor. It's a story you've heard many times. But the real story is what happens in that first few minutes after death. Looking at today's passage from the Word of God, if you're there in Luke chapter 16, verse 19, please say, Amen. Amen. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that the, those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. 
Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. May the Lord add his blessings upon his word. I have three very simple points today. As Jesus corrects us in our thoughts in three simple areas. First, if you look at the screen, He corrects us on our li on living. He corrects us on our lives, or the lives we have while we're living. You know, sometimes life doesn't quite seem fair, does it? It doesn't. It doesn't seem fair. There seems to be such inequality. Some are born strong. Some are born weak. Some are born with a lot of intellect. Others are not overloaded with that. We wonder why my hair, my skin, is this color. Some people are physically attractive and the rest of us walk around like this. Some of us are born into relative wealth as well. Others have been born into terrible poverty. Guys, it's good to work hard and prosper. Amen? But we should never look at those that are financially struggling and think there's something special about us. God has simply blessed us with where we live and what we have. Amen. Every good thing cometh and proceedeth from the Father. Amen? Amen. You know, there are social inequalities as well. Uh, America, not so much. We don't have much of a class system here, but in other societies, they do live in class systems. There, some people are looked upon as high class. But poor people are generally looked down on like the rich man in our text. Uh, by, by, by the rich man in the text at the poor man today. The poor man was nobody. He was a beggar. He was a street person. I'm sure while they were living, everybody wanted to be around the rich man. They wanted to go to the rich man's house. They wanted to ride in the rich man's, uh, well, back then, cart. But I'm also, also equally certain that no one wanted to sit with the beggar. And Jesus is showing, first of all, correct ideas upon living. Never think that you have what you have and for any other reason than God's blessing upon your life. Whether you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or not, what you have has come from God. Are we to be great stewards? Absolutely. Are we to be people that, that do the right thing and, and serve God? Absolutely. And God may choose to bless us in those place, places, uh, financially or with different things and different stuff, or He may choose just to leave us where we are at. In any other case, if we belong to God, we are blessed. We are truly blessed. So first, we see that Jesus corrects us on living. Don't worry about what you have. Don't worry about what others may have. Worry about God has appointed you to have. And whatever you ha have, be happy in that place. And as I've said so many times, we are to be a pipeline of generosity. And however God has blessed you, let that blessing come and flow right through you into the lives of others. Amen? Amen. So first, He corrects us on living. Second, we see correction on dying. In verse 22, if you're still there, please say amen. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Jesus now corrects us on dying. In spite of his vast wealth, the rich man died. In death, the rich man and the poor man meet, even though it's from afar. Look closely at what the scripture says there. It says that the rich man died and was buried. It never says that the beggar was buried. You see, I'm sure that there was a nice funeral for the rich man, but not the poor man. In fact, in those days, they would just take the poor out if no one had made arrangements and there was no place to bury them and throw them in the garbage dump on the outskirts of town. 
We talked about that message a few weeks ago as people from the town were coming out to go for the poor woman's widow who, where her son had died. But when the wealthy died, just like today, it would be vastly different. He would be dressed up. I say he would be dressed up. Let's, let's phrase that properly. The corpse would be dressed up, laid out nicely. His rich friends and family would come, possibly the mayor, possibly even the king if he was a man of noteworthy or noble status. Nice speeches would be made, good deeds were remembered, and people wept for the rich man. None of which changed his destiny one tiny bit. He is still dead. In spite of his wealth, he is dead. In spite of how his corpse appears, he is dead. And so while there is a contrast in the way that these two men died, they both are dead. Amen? Hardly an amen of death, doesn't it? Now I just want to make a note here before we continue on to our next point. You see, one man had a fine funeral and the other man possibly had no funeral at all. There's a contrast in life. There's a contrast in death. Before we get to the next point, I would just like to share that today is my 45th wedding anniversary. <laughs> 45 years. You may, you may commiserate with my wife, Mr. Dan, and you may congratulate me. 45 years ago, at, as a matter of fact, this exact time, the wedding had just started. It was supposed to have started... 16 minutes ago, but she was running a little late that day. <laughs> Meanwhile, I wasn't going anywhere. The pastor and the deacon had me chained up in the little room on the side with all the doors bolted closed and all that. I wasn't going anywhere. I knew a good deal when I saw it. This is going to seem a strange message to give on my, uh, my the, the anniversary of my wedding, but let's get to the main point, and we're going to spend the back bulk of our time in today's scripture. Because Jesus now corrects us about eternity. Our third point is that Jesus corrects us about eternity. Please don't put your Bibles away if we're not finishing 30 minutes early. Look at verse 23. If you're there, please say amen. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. For every human being that has ever been born with two exceptions, Enoch, who said he was caught up to be with the Lord, he walked with the Lord 365 years, and then he was caught up to be with the Lord, and Elijah, who was caught up to be with the Lord in the chariots of fire, there's a life to live and a death to die for every human being that has ever lived. Every single one of them. Followed by an eternity to faith. We are eternal creatures. I want you to understand that. I have folks that, that tell me all the time, the problem with you Christians is that you believe that you're going to live forever. I said, well, that's not exactly true. I believe you're going to live forever as well. The difference is where we spend that eternity. Do we go to an eternity with a good, awesome, loving God? Or do we go to death of an eternity, which is an eternity spent separated from Him in torment? Jesus corrects us about this eternity. Scripture clearly teaches right here that death does not mean extinction. I'm going to say that one more time. Death does not mean extinction. In that our soul will be in existence somewhere throughout eternity. We will exist. Not everyone goes to the same place. Now you may, I'm going to talk about a few words here on for just a moment. I'm going to move around a little bit because it's actually cool in here today and I can move away from where this fan is blowing right now. So, by the way, say amen for the air conditioner working today. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. You guys have been just the best. When we go to talk about eternity and where people go. In the Old Testament times, when people died, they went to a place called Sheol. S-H-E-O-L. And Sheol, depending upon your, your strict interpretation of the scriptures, Sheol is divided into two components. There is Hades, or Hell, or Gehenna. All three are the same place. And there's the bosom of Abraham. And when people died before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, 
if they believed in the promise of God that Christ was going to come and die for our sins, if they believed in God's promise, they went to Sheol in the bosom of Abraham. If a person did not believe in God, if a person did not trust God, did not trust God's plan for all of our eternity, they went into the place called Hades, hell, Gehenna. If you're with me, say amen. amen. After the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, for all of those that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Scripture clearly says, we'll talk about it again in a few minutes, to be absent in the body is to be present in the Lord. Therefore, for those of us that die believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ, we go straight into the presence of God. And all God's children said. For those that do not believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, they go to the bad side of Sheol, which is called Hades, Hell, Gehenna. For anyone that dies, it's too late. We're going to get come back to this in just a moment. But if you're with me so far, please say, Amen. Amen. So, at the end time, when the judgment comes, the great white throne of judgment, I want you to understand that Christians do not go before the great white throne of judgment. We are spectators there. But those that have been locked in Hades will be raised up for their final verdict, and from there, the book of Revelation, we'll talk about it in a little while, from that place right there, when the judgment is given, they are cast into the lake of fire. You with me? Now, the wisdom I crew is tired of hearing this. They hear it all the time. But I just want to make sure we had that perspective. Now here, let's, let's have a quick word about God's heaven. Amen? You ready for some good news? Let's have a quick word about God's heaven. No one knows what God's heaven will really be like. Scripture do give us some glimpses of the glory, but I know this. Jesus has been there preparing it for 2,000 years. It took God six days to make the creation. But the Scripture clearly says that Christ has been there 2,000 years preparing our place in heaven. I think it's going to be pretty spectacular. Amen? Amen. Heaven will be all that the loving heart of God desires for you. Heaven will be all that the omniscient mind of God can possibly conceive of for you. Heaven will also be all that the omnipotent hand of the power of God can prepare and make for you. And here is God's promise. You'll like it. If you look up on the screen at Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, and it says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. When we get to heaven, we will know that we are there because of a righteous judge. Because we are in right standing before that judge. There will be no sorrow. There will be no crying. We will not weep over those that did not make it. Because we will know that our Heavenly Father gave them every possible chance to be there. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. However, in verses 23 to 25, heaven is not where the rich man is at in today's passage. Now, society today does not recognize this. They do not recognize that there is a hell because they do not want any limits on their actions. If they recognize that there is a bad place to go to when you die, then they, have to, then they must recognize that there, there are implications that they are held accountable for their actions while they are living. Most people do believe that there is something after this. How many times have you heard them say, they've gone to uh, what? better place. Well, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they have. Amen? But they deny hell. This does not matter one bit. It doesn't matter what anything thinks. Anyone thinks. The Word of God endures, and as a preacher, I will not attempt to explain away any of it. My job is to declare the truth of the Scripture. Preachers nowadays look at the Scripture and we preach what it teaches if we're honest to the text. People want to joke about hell, but this is no joking matter. Amen? Preachers are called mean and cruel for preaching and teaching and warning. But really and truly, if you knew that a river of fire were coming from a volcano, would you not be going down the street screaming, it's coming. The volcano lava is coming. 
It's coming. And that's what Christians are called to do. We do it in love. We do it with all the tenderness in our heart. But it is our job to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that God has made a way for us to escape this horrible eternity. The gospel message is what we are. It is not something that we do, friends. Sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a knock on our belt. It's not a good, a good deed that we've done. It's something that God has called us to do because of who and what we are and who we have accepted. Amen? Amen. Preachers are called mean and cruel for preaching and teaching about this. But it's far worse to never teach the truth when God's Word teaches this. I don't care about mockers or scoffers. People mock Noah, but the, the flood came. People mock Lot, but Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed in the fire and brimstone. Brimstone. People mocked Daniel, but Belshazzar was weighed, measured, and found one, and is in hell at this very minute. There are at least 162 texts in the New Testament which deal with the doom of the lost sinner, 70 of them spoken by the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I believe in Hades and hell because Christ taught it. But more than that, I believe in hell because the death of Christ demonstrates it. How does the death of Christ demonstrate that there is a hell? Think about it with me for a moment. As the Lord has said, come, let us reason together. If there is no hell from which people need to be saved, then why did Jesus Christ go to the cross and die? He did not die on that cross to save us from a non-existent place. In the name of Almighty God, El Shaddai Himself, please listen to me for just a moment, whether you're in this room or watching on the internet. By every bruise that was beat into His face by the tormentor's fist, by every mouthful of spit that went upon Him, by every hair that was torn from His beard, by every agonizing point of the crown of thorns jammed upon His head, by every lash of the whip upon His body, by every drop of the of His precious blood that fell, by every moment of Christ's agony on Calvary, I declare to you that there is a hell, and you will never convince me that God allowed His Son to go through that to save us from a non-existent place. If there is no hell, then Calvary was the biggest mistake of all time. I believe in hell because the righteous judgment and indignation of God demands it. The idea that wicked people can abuse children, lie, cheat, murder, blaspheme God, then just die and it's all over and they go to a better place, having never confessed what they've done. Romans 12, 19 clearly says that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Book of Hebrews says it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Church, the same Bible that tells us about heaven tells us about hell. There's more, because Scripture tells us what it will be like. First, it is a place of sensory or physical misery. The word torment is used three times in verses 23 to 25. You may underline that at some point. I'm going to read them again. And being in torment, and Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented. Tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that you're in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus and evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. Hell is a place of torment. And here's the amazing thing. It is self-inflicted. Totally self-inflicted. Some people will tell you that once a man dies, he's dead. That there's no consciousness in hell. But it, in verse 24, it says, I, he says, I am tormented in this place. That certainly seems to be a conscious thought. Which brings us to an interesting question. Is the fire in hell real? In other words, is it just the fire that burns in our heart because we're so grieved that we are in a place not with God? 
The answer is yes, it's real. And no, I'm not just another hell and brimstone teacher either. Let me quote Jesus in another verse. Don't miss it. Matter of fact, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. I love to hear the pages of God's Word come. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. If you are there, please say amen. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you curses, into the what? Everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Don't miss that verse. Note this in your Bible. Write it down. Because you're going to be amazed at something I'm about to teach about this particular passage. Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Friends, if you go to hell, you will be an intruder. You will be there for breaking and entering. Because what does that passage that I just read say? Hell is not prepared for you. We were created in the image of God because God wants a relationship with us. Hell was prepared for Satan and his angels. The person that goes there breaks in. You have to, you have to turn away from everything God has, put, has said to you. See, if you reject Jesus Christ and choose to follow Satan, you follow him straight into the hell that was prepared for him and his angels. You have to follow him there. You have to break into that. And so I'm going to preach it like God wrote it. And God wrote that the rich man says, I am tormented in this flame. Therefore, it is physical misery. It's also a place of emotional misery. Back to our passage today, in verse 25, Abraham says to this rich man, Son, don't you remember? Remember. It is scientifically proven fact that our brains store and remember everything. When we get a little older, it's in there. We can remember stuff from 25 years ago, but we can't remember what kind of coffee we had for breakfast. Can I have a testimony? Amen. Yeah, all you older people, don't act like I'm saying something you don't, you don't know. The person that goes to hell will remember everything. They will remember every single thing. They will remember every lie they ever told. They will remember every dirty joke, every time they took the Lord's name in vain. They will remember every gray hair that they gave their parents. If someone is sitting here or listening in, you will remember this service and me standing here warning you with a message that you weren't particularly receptive to. You'll remember the smiling greeters that shook your hand and spoke to you when you came in. You'll remember Jamie and Cliff and our, uh, Jamie and Cliff and our praise and worship team and bands leading us in praise of a holy God. You'll remember the people who prayed for you and begged you to come to Jesus Christ. So you'll have a physical memory. You'll have an emotional misery. But there will also be spiritual suffering in hell. Look at verses 27 and 28. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you will send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. The rich man is in mental anguish, worried that his family will end up where he is at. But here's the most horrifying thing of all. Hell is the place of eternal torment. It's eternal Look at verse 26 again. It says, Besides this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed for those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. It's a place of eternal torment. You know, don't get the idea that someone will go to hell for a while, then they'll have a chance to get out. That passage of Scripture teaches that there is life after death, but there is no passage after death. While you're alive, if you want mercy, you can have mercy for anything you've done. You may say, Pastor Larry, you don't know what I've done. Doesn't matter. Does not matter one bit. The book of Revelation ends with the words, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let whosoever will come and receive the gift of life and drink from the, from the lake, from the uh, pure lake. Listen, friends, doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter. Pastor Larry, I, I haven't read my Bible. Doesn't matter. 
Pastor Larry, uh, I haven't had a chance to come to church much. Doesn't matter. Pastor Larry, I, I'm not a bad, I'm, I'm a bad person. You don't know what I've done. Doesn't matter. When the thief hung on the cross, he said, Lord Jesus, remember me today when you come into your, your place. And Jesus said, This very day I will remember you. I will see you. I will see you in paradise. That thief did not have time to tithe, go to church, do good works. He didn't have time to do anything. He didn't have time to be baptized. All he had time to do was receive Jesus Christ. The place of eternal, eternal anguish. Second Thessalonians, mark this down in your margin. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. It says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with the everlasting, listen to this closely, destruction. It doesn't say destroyed, it says destruction. With everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. There's no second chance after that. While you are alive, if you want mercy, you may have it. If you want forgiveness, you may have it. Jesus Christ died upon the cross and made a bridge for us to, to cross over, made out of the cross of Calvary. And that's the only way. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we can cross from condemnation to salvation. We can cross from death to life if we receive Jesus Christ as Lord. But if you say no and you die, there's no crossing over. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 11 reads this way. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day or night, and worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Terrible. That's just terrible. Looking further back and, and at the great white throne of judgment. Listen to this. Listen to this closely. Remember, this is not for the believer. Picking up, write this in your margin. Revelation chapter 20, beginning at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, for whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged each one according to to his work. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Which is good news today. If you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, your name is book written in the Lamb's book of life. I want you to look around this sanctuary. Take a moment. Just look around this sanctuary. These people will be with you forever. Good Lord. But what we'll be doing in heaven is we, you and I, will all be standing shoulder to shoulder, facing the throne and worshiping our risen Savior. Amen? Amen. It's going to be a glorious, a marvelous thing. Friends, some of the things that I've said today have been difficult to hear. But for those of you that have never accepted Jesus Christ, God sent me here today. God sends me here every single week to give you some good news. Are you ready for some good news? God loves you and He wants you to be saved. Living Hope Church, all of the people sitting right here, during the invitation in just a moment, will be praying that you, whether you are sitting in this sanctuary or are on the internet, that you will receive the Lord Jesus Christ today. God has made it so simple that it's harder to get into hell than it is to get into heaven. In order to get into hell, you're going to have to climb mountains you're going to have to go around blockades to get there. How so? What do I mean? Well, you're going to have to climb over the salvation, the message that I just gave you today, to get to hell. You're going to have to climb over the prayers of God's people to get to hell. You're going to have to climb over every single time you've heard the gospel message to get to hell. You're going to have to climb over the convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God that is pulling at your heart this very second to avoid going to heaven. And you're going to have to climb over the love of God shown on the cross of Calvary by the Lord Jesus Christ. Because hell was not built for you. 
You are created in the image of God. And when Adam was created out of the dust of the earth, and God bent down and breathed life into his mouth, the first thing that Adam saw when he opened his eyes was the face of his creator. Can you imagine the day that we see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face? I want you to know that God loves you. Every star that you see in the sky is God's love written in diamonds in the sky. Every flower that blooms is God's love in full blossom. Every river that flows is God's love in motion. And God is saying to you, I love you and I want to save you. And Jesus with outstretched arms is saying, I died for you and there is no need to be separated from me forever. And the Holy Spirit is touching your heart right now saying, I am calling you to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Folks, God loves you so much. And He sent me here today just for you. So give your heart to Jesus. Remember, there's only one way to get to heaven. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I end today's message as I end every message every single week. I extend to you grace and peace from God the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. With every head bowed and Thank you for joining us today. For more information, visit our website at www.lhcfl.com. Visit us on Facebook or get the Church Link app from the App Store. Again, thank you, and we hope to see you in service soon. Yeah.